just had 18 to 24 cannon. It looks like we're closing in on 60 cannon. And you understand when we first found this, that after we found the 18, 24, 30, 40, it's like, where does it stop? Conservator Scott Herbert is at the first stage of removing some cannon from concretion. This tub over here has some larger concretions in it and a cannon. When the object comes out of the water, the first thing you want to do is put it into a tub. And what you'll do is over a period of two weeks to three, maybe four, um, slowly transfer it from a salt water system into a fresh water. Unlike the pistol, which was manually reconditioned using air scribes, the heavy iron cannons are restored by electrolysis. You are literally reversing 300 years of sitting in the ocean, and this giant concretion that's occurred from the metal breaking down, you have to reverse that entire process, and that is what's so time consuming and so difficult. Once a cannon has been removed from concretion, Debray can begin to understand its story. They're all made in England. They all have the same proof mark. When we see this kind of three sets of numerals, we know that those are English guns. I've determined that two of them were prize cannon. They were taken from other ships. This guy here is French. This is not an English gun. So it's a prize. With cannons like these, sea battles could be fought across huge distances of ocean. The guns found on the Witta had a range of up to half a mile, but to really inflict damage, the ideal range was a quarter of a mile. And as Herber discovered, the Witta's cannon were primed and battle ready. Some of the cannons had musket ball packages in them, indicating basically a giant shotgun that would shoot out at uh, whatever their target was. So there was no doubt in my mind that Bellamy and his crew were absolutely prepared and ready to go because those cannons were loaded and they were loaded well. But there is one final ingredient needed to make the cannons go off with a bang, gunpowder. Amazingly, this has also survived 300 years on the seafloor and the team has found it. That would be in a canister, and that would be shoved all the way at the end of the barrel, where it will be ignited. There's a fuse there. Next to that, you're going to have a wadding. The wadding is there for compression, to give it more power, basically. The cannonball is then pushed against that wadding. Then you put another piece of wadding in front of the cannonball. That is inside the cannon. Now, let's say we want to do more damage. So we take a bar shot and we put it in front. The bar shot, once it leaves the muzzle of the cannon, is not going to go straight like a cannonball. It's going to twirl in the air. And eventually, when it, it meets the sails and the rigging of the other ship, it's going to be going like this and like this, and it's going to do a tremendous amount of damage. Basically, it's going to cripple the ship, and that ship will not be able to get away from the pirates. Black Sam Bellamy and his crew transformed the Widow into a fearsome fighting machine. The cannons were lined up and down the sides of the ship and were most effective when they were all fired at the same time in a broadside. The cannonball was devastating, effective, and there are numerous accounts of cannonballs in naval battles taking off perhaps the heads of 10 to 15 people. If a cannonball hits a bit of oak, lethal splinters fly out in all directions. 
a lot of men were badly injured and in fact killed by the splinters that were like sort of flying daggers. Cannons weren't the only weapon in the pirate's stash. They had an arsenal at their disposal and weren't afraid to use it. Granados, the precursor to modern day hand grenades, were simple yet deadly. You had a wooden fuse and you see there's a hole through it. So through this fuse, you would have powder going in that you would light. They probably would wait until about here when the fuse was there and they would just throw it. Pirates would have used those grenades to stun and disorientate the, the crew. Uh, something like that would have been the last thing they would have thrown at the other ship before boarding. By the time the people that had been hit by those grenades had recovered, the pirates were on board. They had boarded the ship and taken over. Every time Bellamy and his crew captured another vessel, they would transfer that ship's cargo onto their own. Soon Bellamy was in command of a floating kingdom of wealth. The most common treasure taken was in Spanish reals, coins of the time. A real was a unit of weight, and each individual coin weighed eight reals. If a sailor went into a bar and tried to pay for a beer with one of these, there was a possibility the bartender wouldn't be able to make change. So what he would do is uh, break up the coin into eight business pieces or into eight bits. It is these fractions of the single coin that are the famous pieces of eight. The coins recovered from the Witta wreck are from Spain, France, and England. They show that Bellamy wasn't choosy when it came to robbing ships. He'd attack any ship from any country. And once the pirates had their spoils, they made sure that they kept them. This double drilled coin that has two holes drilled in it was an antique even at the time the pirates had it. And you can see how someone drilled a hole so it could be worn around the neck. These coins represent just a fraction of the widow's treasures. You've got four and a half tons of treasure silver pins and buckles and anything of any noble metals, of course, were extremely valuable to the pirates. And we've brought up over and conserved over 100,000 artifacts. Um, so it's, it's just mind boggling. With each ship seized, Bellamy increased his crew. The sailors he captured came from all corners of the maritime world, Portugal, France, Spain, Britain, colonial America and Africa. These Africans were slaves, escaped from the colonies of the Caribbean, who found freedom and a measure of equality among the pirates. Former slaves were free on board ships like the Widow. I mean, Africans were being elected as officers and captains of pirate ships. There may have been as many as 50 African men under Bellamy's command. Enslaved Africans had uh, a, a number of trades that they specialized in something that they could offer pirates. Now, it could be carpentry, it could be something as simple as, uh, as music, it could be sailing, it could be navigation, um, but they brought something to the table. These escaped slaves were embraced as fellow rebels by the pirate captains. The black pirates did enjoy some of the same liberties as white pirates. It was the first time that, uh, that black people um, in an era during slavery were treated as equals. So that's just a phenomenal uh, piece of history that really hasn't been told in this way before. It's ironic that these Africans found freedom on the very slave ships that had once transported them into bondage. Beautiful gold fragments from West Africa are a reminder of the Widow's history as a slave ship. Most of the gold that we've found from the Weta uh, is broken up jewelry of Akan origin. The Akan were a group of tribes on the coast of West Africa 
Uh, one of which was the Ashanti, and to this day the Ashanti are known for the fine quality of their gold work. A closer inspection of them reveals another detail about the pirates and their life on board the Widda. Nearly all the Akan gold jewelry that we've recovered has been broken up. Uh, it was done so by the pirates themselves. They would break up this jewelry so it could be shared out amongst themselves on the basis of weight. They might also fold it up to make it a little bit easier to carry. The broken gold fragments are further evidence of a pirate society founded on fairness. The gold jewelry was equally divided among the pirates, who had a policy of honor among thieves. Every artifact recovered from the wreck of the Widow reveals another detail of pirate life. Even an artifact as simple as a pewter dining plate illuminates their day-to-day -day lives. Diet was pretty monotonous. It consisted of ship's bread, salt beef, and peas pudding. The beef was soaked for a half day and boiled for several hours in order to be edible. And as you can see from the knife marks on this plate, it was none too tender even then. If the sea battles didn't kill you, then the bad food would. The pirates drank grog, water laced with rum and sugar to prevent it from going bad, and ate dried fish, meat, and a biscuit known as hardtack. Fresh food, especially fresh fruit and vegetables, were almost unheard of, and as a result, many pirates died of a disease called scurvy. It did have terrible effects. It Basically, your teeth fell out, uh, your fingers and toes turned black and dropped off. There are whole um, vivid descriptions of, of men saying, I lay there in my bunk and I saw my hand rotting away and there was nothing I could do about it. But the simple pewter plate has another story to tell, a remarkable tale of the pirates on board the Widow, political outcasts and rebels operating their own brand of democracy. Hidden among the knife marks on the pewter plate is an intriguing symbol, a compass and T-square. It could be the mark of the Freemasons. The symbol might allude to a complex story of political rebellion. In 1689, the year of Black Sam Bellamy's birth, King James II was ejected from the throne of England. Historian Ken Kincor speculates that his supporters, the Jacobites, fled England and may have joined the Masonic lodges of the Freemasons on the European continent. Kincor's theory suggests that, loyal to the ousted monarch, some pirate captains joined forces with these Jacobite conspirators and Freemasons. He wonders whether the presence of the Freemasonry symbol on the pewter plate shows that these conspirators may have been among Bellamy's crew on board the Widow. The Widow, Bellamy's pirate ship, was more egalitarian than others, perhaps because of his generous nature. He didn't consider skin color or political belief when choosing a crew. Nor did Bellamy judge according to age, as one unusual artifact discovered in 1989 illustrates. We were looking at a little shoe that we had discovered, and there was a leg bone protruding from the shoe, a fibula, and a silk stocking, a very carefully made silk stocking that the bone was inside and that was inside the shoe. The shoe is of an upper class style. It's approximately a men's size five and it was made to fit either foot as was the custom uh, in those days. The tiny bone, shoe and stocking had them mystified. Surely pirates had bigger feet than this. For years we had thought that that shoe was a small pirate. I said, Ken, that's, that's not a small pirate, that's a kid. I mean, that's a little size five shoe. When we had the lower leg bone tested, we discovered that the bone belonged to an individual no older than 11. 
And if we look through the historical documentation, we indeed have the account of young John King. The riddle of the tiny shoe was solved. It belonged to 11-year-old John King, the youngest known pirate in history. He was traveling with his mother on board a ship called the Bonetta when it was captured by Bellamy in November 1716. When Bellamy called for volunteers for his pirate crew, John King threatened to kill himself unless he was allowed to join. His mother pleaded with him, warning him of the dangers, but he ignored her and became a boy pirate. He would probably have worked as a powder monkey, replenishing stocks of gunpowder in times of battle. John King's remains, the bone, shoe, and stocking, were found embedded in a concretion alongside a cannon. Barry Clifford has now been investigating the Witter wreck site for 23 years. Every summer, when the dive season starts, he goes out to the site to continue his excavations. Even for an old hand like him, excavating the Witter wreck site is extremely challenging. The first task is to get his dive boat into position and anchored above the wreck. That sounds very easy, but when you're moving in the currents that go back and forth, you're liable to move 10, 15 feet, and you know, 10 feet in the middle of the ocean is nothing. But with the help of modern technology, Clifford can precisely pinpoint the area of the 200 by 200 foot site that he wants to excavate. But now with our very, very accurate uh, positioning system, we use a tremble survey grade GPS system. We have sub-meter accuracy, so when we dig, we dig a straight hole, straight down, The pit dug in sand can be as much as 30 feet deep, taking the total depth below sea level to 50 feet. And at that depth, there is a distinct problem. Well, you almost get better visibility if you close your eyes. <laughs> so, and everything is done by sound, you know, with our detectors. We have these probe detectors with the very, you know, points. The probes detect metal. The divers use them to find coins, cannon, lead, domestic artifacts like cutlery, and even personal items like buttons. It's painstaking work. When you're right over the top of a coin, you can hear it. Then you scoop it up with a plastic scoop. You don't see what you bring up sometimes until after you get it to the surface. And all of this is done within a grid pattern that we know precisely where everything comes from. For Clifford, the search for yet more artifacts is never ending. Last year, he returned to the starting point of his underwater excavations all those years ago. Well, we came back last summer, went to the spot. Now, these particular cannons were found in 1984. And what we found under these cannons was a whole new section of shipwreck. Clifford's team realized they had found these cannons way back in 1984, but had never recovered them. Now they presented him with a mystery to solve. You see all of these cannons lined up very neatly side by side. Cannons don't fall off of a ship and all land end up like soldiers standing side by side. These cannons were stored beneath the decks, right on the very bottom of the ship. Now, 300 years later, the cannons are lined up on the sea floor. Clifford returned to his original research and the documents of cartographer Cyprian Southack. We know from Cyprian Southack that the ship turned bottom up, and then he said the decks fell out. And what happened then is all of this tremendous weight came crashing down through the decks and pinned the material that was between the decks, all beneath these cannons. As the testimonies of those who survived the sinking had revealed, the material that lay between the decks was potentially the widow's vast treasure. Clifford thinks he finally understands Southwick's clue. The riches with the guns will be buried in the sand. 
treasure and cannon may be buried together. But the wreck site contains much more than the widow's hoard of gold. It also holds the artifacts and treasures of all of Black Sam Bellamy's other conquests. Last year we found a whole new section of the ship that's going to take us years to excavate. The pirates had rubbed over 54 ships, which is unprecedented really in maritime underwater archaeology. 54 different ships all encapsulated within one ship, buried in the deep sand where it's been preserved perfectly. With a new dive season ahead of him and the exact spot pinpointed, Clifford is eager to get out to the site and discover what further secrets the Widda has yet to reveal. We're going to this location right here, which is a, an eight by eight square. Now our GPS will position right in the middle of this and we'll know precisely where we are the whole time that we're digging this pit. So we're only 15 feet away now and this is where we discovered all of these cannons lined up side by side and we're going back to that same spot. Barry Clifford and his dive team have arrived at the wreck site to make their first dive of the season. 30 feet beneath the sea, the divers have found the cannons lying on the seafloor for the last 300 years. On top of them, they found a huge piece of lead ballast. Lead was a useful commodity for pirates. They would strip it from the hulls of captured ships. Rolls of it, like this, were stored below decks in the widow's hold. We're right on top of that roll of lead. What? Roll of lead. Roll of lead. Just the top of it? Just the top of it. We're right on top of a big roll of lead right now, and we know that underneath that roll of lead there's a stack of cannon. Right. And underneath that cannon, there's rigging sticking up from under it, and um, a lot of interesting shapes. The roll of lead takes Clifford and his team straight to the buried cannons. Beneath those cannons is the unexplored section of the wreck. It holds the prospect of yet more artifacts and possible pirate treasure. To get to this section of the wreck, Clifford needs to raise the cannons. First, though, he must haul the lead to the surface. All right, we're ready uh, whenever you are. After nearly three centuries, another artifact is about to be revealed. Give him a minute. Black okay, here we go. Come on. We have to get down in there. We'd have to be, um, but that's, you'll see flakes all through this. Yeah. And they'll be all in these cracks and the gold tends to go very, very deep. Um, the lead has flakes of gold and gold dust hidden in its crevices. It's an enticing clue to what lies beneath the cannons. First, though, Barry Clifford needs to pull them up. Hey, Jeff, let's start rigging those cannons no matter what. You want to try to bring it up, right? Roger that. OK. Well, if you send out a small line, there's a very unlikely chance now we could break one of them off of the pile. Okay, sending down a line. Beneath Clifford's boat, the diver is trying to attach the line to the cannons, but there's a problem. It's not gonna happen with this. Highly doubt it. It's not there's, not, there's not enough for the rope to bite onto. Yeah, the cannons are joined together on the seafloor in a single heavy lump. The divers cannot get the rope around them to lift them. They measure the cannons and log their positions on the site in the hope they will be able to lift them in the future. Bringing them up will be a long and difficult task. 
It's disappointing news and a blow for Clifford. Even after 23 years of excavation, the ship does not yet seem ready to reveal her final secrets. By April 1717, Black Sam Bellamy seemed invincible. From humble beginnings in England, he has become the Prince of Pirates and captain of the most formidable pirate ship in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, Bellamy goes on a rampage from the Caribbean to the coast of Florida. He just goes on and on, becoming more and more powerful, more and more able, um, capturing ship after ship. The shipping lanes from Europe to the colonies are packed with small merchant vessels, easy pickings for a pirate flagship like the Widow. Nothing, it seems, can challenge Black Sam's reign. You could say this is the, uh, the height of Bellamy's career. It should be the beginning um, of a great uh, series of attacks all the way along the coastline. But something changes his mind. He decides to turn north to head back towards Cape Cod. Something is pulling the pirate captain north. Legend suggests that it may be his heartstrings. The only thing he could think about is now I can return for Maria. Now I'm a rich man. And that's the reason why he turned the bow of the great ship northward. It would prove a deadly decision. One tiny artifact, a stamp for sealing wax, foreshadows an eerily prophetic tale. It depicts two turtle doves above the ocean, representing two lovers about to be separated by a dangerous sea voyage. The French inscription around the edge sounds a solemn warning. Death diminishes. But as Bellamy set sail to return to Maria Hallett, he couldn't have known how prophetic that warning was. So he makes the decision to go north, and it turns out to be a fatal mistake. Whether for love or money, on the morning of April 26, 1717, Bellamy sets a course for north-northwest, the outer banks of Cape Cod. By evening, they are approaching the treacherous waters off the coast. By this time, the weather starts getting a little thick. Fog starts rolling in. And he ordered another course change so that they wouldn't get lost in the growing darkness. The safest course around the Cape would have been north-northeast, but for reasons known only to himself, Bellamy heads due north. He is sailing the Widow parallel to the shore of the Cape and right into the eye of the gathering storm. An east wind comes up and turns to gale force. The wind was whistling up probably a gusts of as much as 70 miles an hour. And in, the, in those almost hurricane force winds, you'll be very hard pressed to get your ship out to sea. So the widow was inexorably being swept closer and closer to the shore. She is being driven ever nearer to the Cape's treacherous shallows. The pirates realized they had gotten in too close to shore that the storm had drove. 